The title of my sermon today is Lord, Heal and Restore the Land of My Life. How many want God to heal and restore the land of your life? I heard some young men talking about mental anxiety and that he needed the healing in his mind. Other people need healing and restoration in their body or their family or their children or their finance or their purpose. How many believe that God wants to heal our lives? God wants to heal our cities, our tri-cities. God wants to heal Seattle. God wants to heal California. God wants to heal America. God wants to heal the nations of the world. I believe God has given us the solution in the Word of God to heal our lands. Clap like you want God to heal the land of your life. Restore, Lord. Father, bless our time together. Let a spirit of wisdom and revelation flow freely and unhindered by any demonic force. I plead the blood of the Lord Jesus over every mind, every heart. Lord, we're ready to receive your word. Just say, say, Lord, we're ready to receive your word. In Jesus' name, come on, somebody give God a praise and say amen, amen, and amen. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, very popular or very famous portion of scripture. Thank God it is. And it says, it, it says this, it says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal and restore their land. And so God here is giving us a promise. He said, if you do your part as the church, then I guarantee you, I will hear it, I will forgive, and I will heal and restore the land of your life. I don't believe healing and restoration begins and ends in Washington. I, begin, I, be, I believe healing and restoration begins right in the house of God. Judgment begins in the house of God. Forgiveness and healing and restoration begins in the house of God. When we get our house in order, the cities, the nations, and the kingdoms of this world will call our God the Christ, and they will bow their knees when we get our house in order. Clap like you believe the word of God is true, that God has the power to heal our land. There is no nation too far gone that God cannot restore and heal. But he needs us to stand in the gap and do our part through humility. So number one, if we're going to have God heal and restore the land of our lives, number one, we have to understand that we have been called by the name of the Lord. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, you have a great calling on your life. That's the wrong neighbor, total wrong neighbor. The, the, the thing you got to get, the, and this is how you know you're next to the right neighbor. If they start foaming at the mouth, it's the right neighbor. No, just kidding. Gonna... <laughs> but they got to talk back to you now. Come on. So tell that same neighbor, because they're nice. Tell them, neighbor, God has a great plan, purpose, and calling on your life. That's why he kept you alive. See, some people shouldn't have made it. Some should be dead. Some of you should have never made it this far. But God kept you alive for a purpose, and God kept you alive for a reason. Come on, clap like God has a purpose for your life. When I first got saved, I heard the pastor say that, and it shocked me because of my, back, my background. I was, when I was a little kid, I was abandoned by my dad and then abused by my stepfather, and so I just became a very evil person. You talk about demon-possessed fully. I was evil. And God had to deliver me. But when I got to my, my pastor's church, he preached a message, Jeremiah chapter 1. If I get emotional, it's not that I'm sad. I just, I'm grateful. And he preached a message that, that God has a plan for your life. Then he preached out of Jeremiah 29, 11 that's plans to give you a hope and plans to give you a future. Plans to prosper you. And in my mind, I thought I was like cursed. I said, I'm sure God has plans, but to hurt me, to destroy me, look at my life. I felt like I was cursed. But when he said that, my spirit jumped up and I received it. And I said, you know what? 
if God has a plan for me, then I want that plan. And part of that plan for my life was to have a beautiful wife, Elizabeth, my Japanese queen. Come on. Part of that plan was to be a father to my, be- my three beautiful children, Joshua, Joy, and Noah. Part of that plan was for me to be a pastor, a minister, to carry a, an apostolic grace, to build God's kingdom, an army. But then as I began to serve God, I realized there was a call that was above those calls. And that was the calling of Christ. And that calling wasn't just for me in particular. That calling was for every single person that calls themselves a born-again Christian. And that's why point number one is we're called to, by God to be an army of soul winners and disciple makers. Yes, I'm called to be a husband. Yes, I'm called to be a father. I'm a businessman, so I believe that's part of my entrepreneurial grace. And I use a lot of my finances to further the kingdom of God. And I believe I have a grace of an apostolic grace to build God's kingdom. But before those callings, I have another calling. And that's the calling that Jesus gave to those disciples right before he left this earth. He sat, it wasn't just 12, it was many more than 12. It was 400 if you study it. And there was 400 there and he looked at all 400 and he says, he rose from the dead and he said, all authority, not some authority, not poquito authority, come on now. All authority. It's like when you go get a burrito. When you, when I go get a burrito, I don't say, oh, just keep, I say, con todo. Everything. Throw, throw the chihuahua in there, throw it all in there. Come on, so I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. Sorry, I like dogs, so I'm just playing. So I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I like to... <laughs> That's what he told the disciples. He said, all authority, not a little bit, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And then he turned around and said, and now I give it to you. How many believe that you have been given all authority? That there's no devil, there's no demon, there's no, stru- there's no bondage that's greater than the authority that God has given to every believer, every believer. The moment you got born again, those that just got saved, got baptized, they got all power over the enemy, all authority. They may have to learn it and walk in it, but the moment they receive Christ, they step into that full rank of authority and power. All authority. Come on, clap. Like you have all authority. All authority. Not a little. All the authority. Come on. All authority, both in heaven and earth. Then he says, therefore, with this authority, and I always think about these, these, you know, as a pastor, I've been at the bedside of many people who have breathed their last breath. And, and it's always different. Sometimes it's glorious. Sometimes it's quite sad. People are just fighting for that last breath. Been there many times. But at, at the, I think about my grandma. Her death was glorious. She was a prayer warrior. But right before she went to be with the Lord, she didn't speak English. She was only, well, she shrank every year. Grandma Kuka, come on. She started about this tall, but she was like Yoda, though, powerful. (laughs) You know, Yoda moved real quick, you know, in the spirit. She was powerful, man. And she was dying. She was gone. She was going home. And right before she died, she, like, sat up out of the bed. It's kind of, she scared me. Cause she's like a hundred and something. We lost track. She's, she was from Mexico. She didn't come here legally. Come on, somebody. She came in a bus on the bottom. Come on. <laughs> she got here though. She got here. Grandma Kuka got here. And it's right before she died, she stood up like, whoom. And she was a Pentecostal lady. She was actually part of the Azusa Street revival. She stood up and she called for me. She laid hands on me. And she's like speaking in tongues. Da, 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 da. I'm like, ah. And then she shared a few words, her last words. And then she went home to be with the Lord. But those last words represent the totality of what she represented in life. Those those were the words that carried everything she was about. And she wanted to make sure that what she carried, she imparted to the next generation. I believe that day I received a spirit and a mantle of prayer. Because that was important. She couldn't read English. She could only read the Bible. But that when that woman would pray, oh God, 
heaven would come down. One of my nephews went there one time. He was running from a bad thing he did with crime. I can't say, you know, we're on live stuff like here. Statue of limitations real in California. <laughs> and he went there to hide at Grandma Kuka's house. He was a big guy, tattooed from his forehead, back of his head to his toenail. This, this was a hardened gangster. He goes, Grandma Kuka, can I just hang out? She's like, yes, mijo, yes. Oh, old, you know, a cookie, some papa. She's cooking, but she's got a scheme. And she goes, she's going to feed him. She goes, mijo, can I pray for you? And, she, yeah. and she's like, okay, Grandma. <laughs> and she dropped him, cast the devil out of him right there. That boy became a preacher, man. This was a power. Yoda, I told you, the, shaka, the force is strong with this one. So that's, that, that's the totality of her life right there. That's the end of her life. Right there, she's going to give everything she's about. So you could honestly say this would, would be the last sermon Jesus really gives before he goes home to heaven. This is the most important message Really, he ever preached. He saved the best for last. He taught us that when he turned water into wine. That he saves the best for last. He's a crescendo God. He's like a symphony. And he builds and he builds. He heals the sick. He raises the dead. He casts out the miracle after miracle. Milagro after milagro. And he crescends with all authority. It's been given to me both in heaven and in earth. Go therefore and make disciples. What? Make disciples out of all nations. That means all ethnicity. That's why I refuse to be just a Latin church. We are a Latin church. We are a white church. We are a black church. We are an Asian church because we have been given authority to break the spirit of racism. Come on and shout like discipleship breaks that spirit. <laughs> baptizing them. Baptismo. Immersion. Baptizing them in the name of the Father in the name of the Son and in the name of the Holy Spirit. And don't just baptize them. Now teach them. Here's discipleship. Teach them to observe. Teach them how to obey. There's the rub. Because Americans, we don't obey nobody. That's how we became America. We disobeyed the Queen. It's in our Constitution. These independent states of America and we have a spirit of independence about us but the kingdom of God is not an independent spirit it is a codependent spirit I need you and clap like we're going to break a spirit of independence all authority has been given to me both in heaven and in earth go therefore and make discipline once Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Teaching them. Teaching them. Child training them. It's a beautiful child. What's, it, what's the child's name? Huh? Theo. And what's your name? Ivan. This is your baby? Got the blonde hair. Pray it stays. All right? This little baby, you have a responsibility to disciple him. You have a responsibility to disciple him, to, to teach him to obey. First of all, you two. Because if he can't obey you, he won't obey anybody. That's good. Come on. And the Lord spoke to me 10 years ago, nine now. He said, son, I want you to take, you built a great church. It was like 2,000 members at the time, almost 2,000. And I looked out and he said, look at that. And I got nervous because... It was getting bigger, quicker. Baptizing 100 people every, every, every two, three weeks. Still do that. It was getting bigger, but I got scared because I saw it getting bigger 
and bigger and shallower and shallower. And I realized this is becoming a consumer church. But Jesus asked me to make disciples. These are not disciples. These are Christians that attend. But if I ask them to lay their lives down, they'll be the first to leave Jesus. That's why COVID exposed what we really built. Come on, somebody. But that's your child. And the Lord spoke to me. He said, son, you love Joshua. You love Joel. You love Noah. You give your life for those boys and your daughter. Everything you have, you give because you love them. Because the problem is you don't love my kids the way you love yours. And if you'll love them the way you love yours, I'll give you an army and I'll give you a sustainable revival. And today, I've made up my mind that we're going to love God's people like we love our own children and we're going to disciple them and we're going to train them and we're going to raise them. Come on, clap. Like, come on, if my people, if my, come on, if my, we got the prayer, we got the seek, we turn from the wicked way, but we haven't answered the call. If my people were called by my name, so that calling of saying, okay, you know what that required me to do? That required my love to get bigger. My love for my children, I had to put it on God's children now. That's why Paul made strange statements in the New Testament. He called one church, you know what the, he called the church of Galatia? You know what he called them? Paul was never married. Paul never had children. And he called them my children. Paul, you never had children. Paul's like, yes, I have. These are spiritual children. And I take full responsibility. Not just to convert them, but to form the character of Christ in them. To take the authority I have and not just cast a devil out, but to journey with them because that devil may be gone, but his mentality is still in them. Come on, somebody clap like this is a journey, not a moment. Some of you know what I'm talking about. You got delivered on these altars but you still have crazy thoughts going on. Of course, because the spirit's gone, but the spirit carries a voice and that voice creates a mentality. And now you have to get a more metamorph more, a metamorphosis and you gotta go to the word of God and you have to have a leader journey with you to reframe your mentality so you never go back and not just never go back. Somebody is in your future that needs the freedom you got on that altar. Come on, somebody clap like we're gonna raise an army of soul winners and disciples makers not a religion it's not a religion this is a conviction that's why I said okay Lord let's do it I like to come down here I like him I appreciate you I like you he's the internship director no wonder why his hair is red he looks good look Who's the red-haired guy in the Bible? Red, red and hairy. Are you hairy? No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Esau, Esau, Esau. <laughs> so I started. So then I got 2,000 members, and I saw, now I have to like, okay, we're going to make disciples. And I started preaching it, and people looked at me like some of you are looking at me. It's not that bad, actually. But you're pretty good. But they were looking at me like, what do you mean? Yeah, God wants you to make disciples. Make disciples? Who? What? What are you talking about? Now, that's what God says. And I, then, I, then I took it to another level. I said, actually, this is what the Bible really teaches, that we're all going to stand before God and actually have to give account for our obedience to that commission. So when you get to heaven, and I get to heaven, it's not just who got, the, who got saved, but where are your disciples? And so if I ask most people in this room today, where are the disciples you're working with? Most people in this place would have nobody. But yet Jesus said, that's why I gave you the authority. I didn't give you authority just to get, get cast a demon out of them. That's the very first step. Now that the demon's gone, what are you going to do with them? You got to journey with them. That's what my pastor did. He took me into his home. Because he realized, if I don't journey with this boy, he's not strong enough to make it by himself. He's a baby in the Lord. And the enemy will wipe him out. So he journeyed with me and spoon-fed me milk until I got stronger. 
until I became a child. And then children need bread and began to teach me the bread. And then I got stronger. And then young men overcome the wicked one and you give them meat. And then I got strong. And then I began to eat strong meat as a father. And now I can multiply. But he carried me because he loved me. Will we carry a generation? Come on, somebody. Will we carry a generation into the Holy of Holy? Into the presence of God? If not, well, you'll have like I had a big turnover. Church became like a revolving door. People would come, they'd stay for a while, but then eventually they'd go back to the world. Because the Bible says when the word is sown, the wicked one comes to steal the word that God put in their heart. He'll send persecution their way. And they'll get offended and leave the church. They'll send tribulation, hard times. And if they're not being discipled and tribulation hits, hard times hit, they quit. Some people are in this room. You're, you're here right now. You're, you're here, but you quit. You quit. You tithe. You come. But don't ask you to do nothing because you already quit. And some people literally quit. And that word is sown and the enemy's Goes after, he sends, what, the world, the lust of the flesh, the distractions, the love of money. I started preaching to our church. We got to make disciples. You know what they started feeding me? I'm busy. Busy doing what? I got to make money. So now money is more important than the commission. This is where you find out who's who. Do you really love God? Or is it just this? Because if you really love God, you're going to lay your life down so somebody else can live. We expect pastors to do it. We expect leaders to do it. But don't put that on the church. That's not our responsibility. Ike? That means what? Come on, somebody. What does the Great Commission say? I got three claps. I told you. Somebody help me preach. Come on. Come on, this is a revival. This is not a Sunday morning sermon. This is how you break open the Tri-Cities. This... Come on, clap. Come on, shout. Come on, give God praise. We'll go. My people. So I started working with the people. And people, you know what they did to me? It was the devil, people that have been with me years. Because what happens is, I don't know where you are spiritually. Everybody in this room is somewhere. You're in four stages, everybody. You're either a baby in the Lord, and there's nothing wrong with that, right? There's a baby. Is there anything wrong with this baby? It's a beautiful baby. But if you came back in two years and it was still a baby, we got a problem. <laughs> but in church, we accept it. It's five years later, still looking like a baby. Oh, it's okay. It's not okay, doc not okay at all uh-oh four stages everybody in this room you're either a baby or you're a child in the Lord this is what we got to teach people not just to eat everything because that's what children do they eat everything I like this YouTube guy and this YouTube time he's gonna prophesy he's gonna give me a special anointing oil he's gonna give me a rag come on somebody here I'll give you a, a oil here's some oil I got oil on me come on now <laughs> hey come on it's been, uh, all right this is where you get all the weird stuff. It's okay. Children are weird. It's okay. Children talk. They make no sense. Like, my son says brilliant things like, Dad, you know, I want to be a preacher like you, and I want to be, and I want to be Spider-Man. Like, okay. <laughs> Children, expect it. But then the third stage, somebody in there, you're a young man or young woman. You eat the meat, and that Bible says you're the ones in leadership. You overcome the wicked one. Your leadership now. You're, you're, you're an internship program. Then you go to that next level where your pastors are. And that's, you become a father, a multiplier. You can be trusted. And now you eat that strong meat. But you have little babies wanting to eat strong meat. And it's going to choke them and confuse them. Well, everybody in this place is in one of those four levels. And so if you're a baby, yeah, it's not time to make disciples. It's time to get better. If you're a child, it's not time to make disciples. It's time to get better. But if you're a young man and you're not making disciples, you'll die on the vine. Because you're not fulfilling your purpose. And it, God, I gotta say something. I'm gonna say something. I'm gonna say something. Inside every person is the grace and the authority and the ability to obey that great commission. That means you are a disciple maker, whether you know it 
or not. Just like you're a healer, whether you know it or not. You're a deliverer, whether you know it or not. You are wealthy, whether you know it or not. Because when Jesus came inside of your life, he is the great disciple. Somebody give God a shout of victory like you believe it's true. So, I got I to gotta close. And so, I started doing this. <laughs> and the, the people started manifesting. I thought I'd already did deliverance on them. <laughs> they manifested their rebellion. Do my own thing. They might manifest it. I'm leaving. Why? Because I'm, I decided. This is what I decided. I'm, I keep using this beautiful baby, all right? I am. Does this baby have diapers? Okay. Does, and and it, does, it, does he change his own diapers? No. So you change it. You do too? <laughs> Who does it more? No, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. Who, who's up in the middle of the night? That's good, brother. You're winning with me already. Okay. He's being, he's just like, oh my God. Okay. Okay. So, so you change the baby's diapers. Okay. There's nothing wrong with that. Because that's what pastors do. That's what leaders do. We change baby's diapers. Because a lot of you do a lot of poopies. <laughs> Come on, somebody. All right? Right? So finally I told him, some of you I'm going to change your diapers. But some of y'all been here four years, five years, and you still want me to change your diaper? You're dealing with the same devils you dealt with when you first got here. The same mentality, the same marriage problem. Same. No, no, you got to conquer now. And you got to help somebody else's marriage. You got to help somebody else get out of drugs. You got to help somebody else get out of depression. You have to, have, come on somebody. Come on. This is powerful, man. Wow. So when I did that, Sit there, sit there, Spanish. Please sit down. So, when I said that to them, they manifested. They started leaving. What? What? I pay you my tithe to change my diaper. They didn't say it, but they said it by leaving. And as a matter of fact, I'm going on Instagram because all my friends are pastors in the area. So, I'm going down the street. Finally, I started calling my friend. We got wind of it. Like here they come. By the way. Pastors know each other. <laughs> we got a weirdo coming. You got the, you got the, the parking lot prophet. <laughs> He's coming. You know the parking lot prophet? You know about the, you don't have him here? You don't have him here. Oh no, watch this. Watch, oh brother, watch, watch this. Watch this. This is a funny story. No, you'll like this one. Had the, oh, I gotta, I'm out of time. Okay. So I had this girl, Joyce. She was a prayer warrior. She loved the Lord. She was always smiling. Like, always smile. She's like that kind of person that's just happy, right? She sits there, and me and my wife are there. I say, hi, Joyce. I gotta talk to you. She looks sad, like her countenance fallen. I felt like the Lord. Why has thou countenance fallen? And she goes, she's like, uh. I was like, what's wrong, Joyce? You're never like this. She's like, well, he gave me a word. I said, uh-oh. Where in the parking lot? What word, Joyce? He said, I'm his wife. I said, he did, huh? And then the gangster come out. Come on, somebody. I said, is that right? <laughs> I said, is that right? I said, okay. He said, yeah. And, and, and I go, I go, I go, so the, the Lord didn't speak to you, right? She goes, no. I said, what's wrong? He's ugly. Come on, somebody. <laughs> he was doing that witchcraft. That witchcraft, brother. Da, 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 the Lord says. <laughs> so why are some of you looking at me weird? Come on. I think I got a few of them. I'm going to get you. I'm going to get you, doc. So I got to close. I'm going to close now, I promise. I'm a good Pentecostal preacher. I close 10 times. Come on, somebody. Like, like how many will give me five minutes? How many? Come on. Five, 10, 15, 20. Come on, somebody. Okay. No, I'm serious. I'm going to wrap it up. So I started working with the people, and they started leaving because I said, I'm not going to change your diaper forever. Just like your child. You're going to change your diaper for years, but there's going to come a time you're going to say, mijo, you're going to change your own diaper. And you may have an accident here and there, and you'll help him. But the bottom line is eventually he naturally will have his own children, have his own family, and he'll do the same thing you're doing. But in the church, we never raise him to do that. And when we do, they bark out, control, religious, what's wrong? Ah! No, the problem is you're not obeying the commission because the commission brings true cross Christianity. Yeah. 
Because raising this child will change you way more than it changes him. And true discipleship will change you way more than it'll change those you're working with. And that's why people don't do it. But if we say we love God, we have to pick up our cross, deny ourselves, and raise God an army. I want to know, is there anybody here that loves God enough that says, at some point, I make up in my heart and mind, I'm going to obey the great call of Christ. Come on, you may be watching online, you may be in this place today, but something in your heart has to say, maybe not today, but there's going to come a time where I'm ready and I'm willing to do God's will. I will save souls. I will make disciples. Somebody give God a praise. Please stand on your feet. Please, please, please. I feel, I feel the anointing right now. I feel it strong. I'm going to do something I haven't done yet. I'm going to do it right now. I want everybody to stand if you're able, please. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're in this place today and you say, Pastor Jason, I hear this message and I receive this message and I recognize I'm going to stand before God and give account for this great call, this call to win souls, this call to make disciples. And I want to hear those words when I stand before the Lord. When I stand before the Lord, I want to hear those words. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. I heard something right now. Can I say something? And I'm going to say something. I'm going to pray. Look at me quickly, please. When I introduced this to the church, two people opposed me a lot. A lot of people did, but two really opposed me. You know what it was? My own mother and my wife. Because my wife is naturally more of an introvert. I'm the extrovert. I know you can't tell. Come on, somebody. She's more introverted. And my mom, she was just being honest. I don't want all these people coming messing in my house. Come on, somebody. I said, Mom, the Lord gave you that house. You want them to take it away? That didn't move her. She's like, oh, gee. She's like, whatever. Come on. I'm like, okay, Mom. This is what the Lord says. And then the Holy Spirit spoke to both of them on their own. They read the scripture. It wasn't me having to tell them. It was God. My mom did it. My mom has probably, she got up to 65 women groups. Six, seven hundred women at 74. Monster disciple maker. She's a beast. The one that fought me on it. Her flesh fought me. Once she yielded to God, she, her, her whole life and the value of her life. She was already valuable, but the value of what she means to the kingdom is on another level. My wife now, out of the 500 groups, she probably has 300 of them under her. There's like 3,000 women in our church strong, an army, because she said, you know what? My flesh is not going to tell me what to do. Jesus asked me to do this, and I'm going to do it. You know what? Right now, we have like five, 600 groups. We have four or 5,000 people in groups. It's a revival in Los Angeles, and every pastor, my friends, told me, you can't do that in Los Angeles. You can't do that in America, and for sure not in LA, and you can't. You can do it in another nation, but not here. The people are too independent. I said, no. I don't care if they leave. I don't care what they do. I got to be obedient to God. I got to love these people back to life. And I know if I don't disciple and we don't disciple, they're not going to make it. And I love God and I love these people too much to leave them the way they are. We can't just cast demons out out of them because we're good at that. We do it all the time. But we have to take them from deliverance to freedom. Come on. That means we got to take them from Pharaoh's house to a promised land. Come on. Shout like God. That's a promised land of favor. It's my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways I will hear from heaven I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land hey thanks for watching this video if you enjoyed this content and this was a blessing to you would you help us and hit thumbs up so that it could help more people to discover this video it costs you nothing but it can go a long way to help with the algorithm as well as if you're not subscribed to our channel hit subscribe, click on the bell so that you can be reminded each time that we upload videos. Thank you so much for being a part of this community. If you're interested in learning more about Hungry Gen, our internship, our conferences, deliverance, and so many other things, go to HungryGen.com for more information. And as always, remember, better is not good enough, the best is yet to come.